Cars are just like creating a character in Fallout. You only get so many attribute points to put in certain areas. While you can max out your strength and beat up a bunch of people smaller than you, you sure as hell aren't gonna have the charisma points to ask for more money after that assassination job that you just got tricked into doing. Anyway, there are three attribute points to cars. You have reliability, affordability, and power. I like to call it the triangle of death because one of them has to die. You can only pick two. And in a perfect world, let's be real, we're throwing reliability completely out the window and we're gonna dive right into cheap, powerful cars. But at what cost? Well, buds, you're gonna wanna go grab yourself a cold one, sit the f down and shut the f up because today we're gonna be looking at the best cars that are the worst to own. But really quick before we jump in, this is your last call to get entered into the Artisa giveaway. That's right guys, we're giving away a full set of Artisa wheels that your little heart desires. But you can't win if you don't enter. And you can't enter if you keep waiting because this giveaway ends tomorrow, September 17th at midnight central time. And then this merch and the free wheels are gone forever. So what are you guys waiting for? Go over to feminindustries.com, get entered now. Starting out this list with an absolute must drive. The B5 generation Audi S4 is a car that on paper kind of sounds terrible 250 horsepower is a bit outdated the engine hangs in front of the axles it's a bit heavy and they're a bit high maintenance but holy shit, if these cars aren't a blast to drive and a pleasure to look at they sound the business they can make decent power quite easily with a turbo swap and some fuel mods they handle awesomely considering the engine placement and the size is just spot on Honestly, a driving experience that rivals that of similar vintage BMW M3s, except it makes more power and makes a way better noise and is boosted from the factory. Trust me, once you drive one hard, you will have to have one of your own. And good God, when you get a good set of wheels on these cars, a German-made BBS on a B5 S4, bring it down to some coilovers, give it an aggressive functional stance with an aggressive Michelin tire, I will always be a sucker for that. But you know, you can't really have Audi and S4 and B5 in the same sentence without summoning an Audi tech with an invoice to seize all of your assets to be able to afford it to keep it roadworthy. These cars were pretty well packed with tech when they came out. The twin turbos are low mounted and require some engine lifting or some subframe dropping if you want to access them and change those things out for an upgrade or to replace them when they go bad inevitably or repair a failing stock turbo, which happens pretty frequently. The timing belt is also something you're going to want to replace if you don't have any documentation for that. And while it's a pretty straightforward job at the end of the day the whole front end is coming off and you may as well get in there and replace those plastic thermostat housings that leak replace that old water pump and have the motor mounts done since you have access and then when you're done the bumper will never ever 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 line up again and it will literally steal all of your money but hot damn if the b5 s4 isn't one of the most beautiful fun and timeless disasters of all time. Arguably one of the most recognizable and most modified tuner cars in all of tuner culture has its very own name for its plethora of issues over time. DSM problems are the kind of problems that keep me lying awake at night. The 1G and the 2G Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX, the Eagle Talon TSI and the Plymouth Laser RS sound like the most perfect combination of all time. A small turbocharged coupe with podium proven drivetrains and an all wheel drive system damn near straight out of the Evo. One generation had pop up headlights and the second iteration was one of the best looking JDM cars of all time and then it was made famous by the fast movies. Who wouldn't want that? Well, it actually turns out that the platform was so affordable, popular, and easy to modify and had a huge, super cheap aftermarket selection that 99.9999% of the 1 and 2G DSMs have been beaten into the ground, neglected, and poorly modified. And over the course of 20 to 30 years, even most of the good examples are hiding a lot of stories beneath their skin. And even if you do come across a 50,000 mile unmodified, somehow not rusty example, you're gonna be paying some damn good money for one. So there are a lot of sacrifices with these cars and I wouldn't wish DSM problems on anyone but man are these cars cool they can look absolutely killer with a jdm inspired wheel like a work or a gram light or even an anki now listen to me listen to me very 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 closely never ever ever mess with the 1g on rpf ones and meaty tires all right you're just gonna lose i would love to add one of these cars to my fleet someday but i'm gonna need a lot more money for some DSM problems. One of my favorite cars of all time is also my least favorite. The Mark IV generation Volkswagen holds a very near and dear place in my heart. The Jetta, the GTI, it doesn't really matter. All you need to know is that you can get into a two-door hatchback or a convenient sedan with an upscale-ish interior for its time with either a turbocharged engine or a really, really good sounding VR6, both of which usually came with the manual transmission. They were also both pretty easy and cheap to modify and a guy could go make 300 horsepower for not a whole lot of money. I just, you know, when you said get your feet wet with the Mark IV, I didn't think they meant it, so... 
literally. You see Mark IVs have this awesome thing where the sunroof drains get clogged and the water leaks inside of the cabin, inside the back of the dash, and then drips down onto your feet and then goes into your carpet. <laughs> Wet carpet mold is a totally different smell than the factory crayon smell made by the interior materials. 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 And these cars have always nickeled and dyed me to absolute death. But there's just something about a Mark IV Volkswagen that does something for me, you know? These are great starter projects for someone looking to learn the hard way. And they offer a very unique, in a good way, driving experience. I learned so much and I will always cherish the Mark IV, even if I had to change my girlfriend's GTI transmission seven times because I thought it was cool to go 10 miles an hour in reverse before hitting the rev limiter and then dumping it into first gear to do a burnout and proceed to blow the trans with the hardest and fastest shift to second that you've ever seen. There are just so many aftermarket parts for these cars that you can relatively cheaply get these cars, the wheels, tires, and suspension treatment and some go fast bits as well. These are great first cars to modify if you hate yourself. Now this one is the one I always fall for. As it turns out, you can just go and get into the, any top of the line cutting edge of technology and comfort luxury cars from 20 years ago for dirt cheap. I'm talking about your Mercedes AMGs, BMW 5 and 7 series, Audi A and S8, stuff like that. Big fat luxury cars that used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and have big honking 500 horsepower engines that you can buy now for like 10 grand and I'm all about it. I mean, come on, you can just go buy a 2006 S600 with a 500 horsepower, 600 torque, twin turbo V12 that runs 12 with almost 129 hour track speed at 13, 20. It's so asinine to me that more people don't do it. And that's why I went and picked up a reasonably priced E55 AMG. Sure, it weighs over two tons, but it has a 470 horsepower supercharged V8 under the hood, has massaging seats and factory air suspension. But man, can sh go downhill very, very quickly. This car came with over $40,000 in receipts for maintenance, and I've dumped in a whole heap of money into the car myself. From non-stop electrical issues that drain all the batteries, yes, plural, all the way to an exploding crank pulley that grenades everything standing in its path. This probably isn't a good starter car, but oh my God, is it worth it. The most satisfying thing in the whole wide world is to roll up on an overly confident scat pack owner and give them the bust length, all you can eat Gapplebee's buffet for one tenth of the goddamn price. If you can keep the supercharger belts on, and the AITs in check. Not to mention these cars can look absolutely baller with a nice luxury oriented set of wheels. I personally went with some 20 inch flow forged pieces from one of my favorite wheel brands of all time, Borsteiner. BBS, HRE, Heritage, Vossen, they all look really good on big cars. But what is the best worst car to own. Well, in all honesty, I think we're all thinking the same goddamn thing. You know what I mean? It's the Super WRX STI, you silly little goose. They're taxed as hell. I literally have not known a single person who has owned a Subaru, whether it's modified or completely stock, that hasn't had an engine blow the hell up. The interiors are, for lack of a better term, complete and utter trash. The spark plugs are a pain in the ass to change. They have all kinds of oil leaks and oil consumption issues, ringland failure, you name it, these cars will break it. But all in one convenient package is a very well-sized sedan with adequate horsepower. It's easy to modify. It makes turbo noises and has that classic rumble. Not to mention that the DNA in these cars comes from a long line of legitimate rally winning success. As unreliable and plastic key as these cars are, I totally get the appeal. Really, you can kind of go anywhere and do anything fun. Fun on the street, fun off-road, and more importantly, being capable off-road. And they're so damn popular that even when you blow yours up, there's a ton of online resources for you to reference to get your Subaru back on the road in no time. Terrible cars. Great, capable fun havers. Now those are just some of my personal top picks. What I really want to know is what are your favorite cars that suck to own and why? So let me know in the comments below. And if you want to stay up to date with the latest news and information about all things wheels, tires, and suspension, make sure you guys are subscribing and hit that thumbs up. It helps us get in front of a bunch of other car enthusiasts just like yourself. I'm Sean from Fitment Industries. Show me to F on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to go get entered into the giveaway. Peace. Hello?